Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Eric Lockhart from uh, the National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory. Um, thank you for joining this Distributed Generation Interconnection Collaborative webinar. Uh, so we're, we're excited for this timely discussion on DER aggregation research and uh, recent pilots. Um, so before we get started with the presentations, I'll just provide a brief background about DGIC, and then, and then we can turn to the presenters. Um, so DGIC uh, was um, founded in 2013, um, and it's sort of been focused around a number of webinars, as well as some uh, publications with original research and a number of blog posts on the DGIC uh, website. Uh, the program is supported by the DOE Solar Energy Technologies Office, uh, CETA, um, and it's DGIC is intended to be a sort of stakeholder-driven and uh, truly a, a collaborative. So our, our hope is that uh, content such as this webinar is driven by uh, what we hear from participants to be priorities in the interconnection and in integration space. Uh, so through uh, data and information exchange, uh, like this webinar, uh, the idea is really just to sort of advance conversations on key interconnection integration topics um, as more and more uh, jurisdictions uh, grapple with uh, some of the challenges and opportunities associated with uh, just DER uh, penetration. Um, when the program was first founded, it, it looked primarily at DPV, and we've since um, broadened to include other DERs and how they relate back to distributed uh, PV. Uh, and this is an example of, of taking a broader perspective to look at a, a suite of DERs and how they might uh, work together. Um, the, the, the sort of two primary pillars um, uh, for DGIC, uh, one is that practices and protocols pillar, um, and that's what I was just describing a little bit, that there, we've been doing case studies, um, some original research, uh, data analysis, and the idea is to kind of draw out emergent best practices, both from research and from uh, kind of pilots, such as the two we'll be talking about today, um, to, to try to um, it, it advance uh, kind of understanding and, and, and progress in the industry. Uh, and this, the second pillar is really part and parcel of the first. It's this peer exchange piece that's um, webinars like this and blog posts and content that we post and curate on the on the website. Uh, okay, with that brief intro, I'll just say a few words about logistics, and then we can uh, jump into the presenters. Uh, so uh, everybody's on mute. Uh, throughout the webinar here, and uh, if you have questions, uh, we encourage you to type them into the questions pane as we go, uh, and then we'll collect those together for a Q&A session at the end. Um, and there's also a, a, a chat window in case that you have any trouble with the audio or anything like that. So um, keep keep adding the questions, and I'll, I'll try to get to clarifying questions if, if they come up, but we'll, we'll reserve the bulk of the Q&A um, for the end. And we are recording this webinar, and uh, we'll be posting it to the DGIC website within the next week or two. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with uh, Jeff Cook from NREL um, talking about recent uh, research uh, on DER aggregation. Uh, it takes a sort of broader perspective of where the space is going and what some of the challenges and emergent solutions might be. Uh, and then we'll turn to Sergio Islas from SCE um, to talk about their pilot, and then Kurt uh, Stogdill from Austin Energy to talk about a pilot program that they've been running um, so that we can sort of look at what they've learned so far on uh, their specific pilot programs and see where what pathways might be to, to scaling DR aggregation in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Jeff Cook um, to start us off. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, this is Jeff Cook from NREL. I'm working our markets and policy group here at the lab. Um, and looking at the specific question around expanding PV value um, through DR aggregation. And the focus here is on utility-led programs. There's a variety of programs at the wholesale market level um, or consideration of programs at that level, um, folks like PGM and others. And we are not um, focused on that today. We're rather focused on um, these utility programs. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, a key question here, or the question, or the foundational question for this project, um, sorry, just one second, um, there we go, um, is 
what are we going to do with the higher penetration of PV on the grid? Um, and so we know that if you have a lot of PV, particularly on one individual feeder, it can have a, it can cause a lot of challenges when you've designed a grid for one-way power flow as opposed to two-way power flow, which we're seeing now. Um, one way, one method to address these grid impacts um, is to aggregate um, distributed energy resources like PV, electric vehicles, and battery storage, among others, to help actually um, provide you know load reduction or load um, um, uh, support as well as other functions such as frequency response and voltage regulation. Um, and, there's, and so given that DERs can provide these services or could potentially provide these services, some utilities are starting to, con starting to conduct pilot programs to test this functionality and see how it works um, in the real world. Um, and so just so we're all on the same, um, we're on the same platform or we're at the same foundation of knowledge, um, the question is, what is distributed energy resource aggregation, um, and how are we defining it um, for our purposes here? Um, and so this figure is probably the best way to understand it. Um, and so there's the utility, um, and they typically develop some sort of DER management system, also known as a DERMS, that really acts as the brains of the program. Um, and it sends, it, un, it takes grid data, um, understands where there might be problems on the grid, and then puts out market signals to a variety of DERs on its system to provide a particular um, a grid function. And so then we move to the right side of the figure um, where you have the participating DERs, and this could be um, utility distributed of resources. Um, it could also be um, individual commercial, you know, residential customers that have PV on the rooftop that participate in the DER aggregation program and interact directly with the DERM, or there could be a DER aggregator incorporated in the program, um, as shown here, that aggregates a bunch of you know, residential commercial systems and different types of DERs and then provides services um, to the DERMs and, and the broader grid um, by um, calling on some of those systems uh, that it controls. So that's um, how we define DR aggregation. And so, as I'd mentioned before, um, utilities are getting interested in this space. And so, NREL's developed a research agenda around these three general questions. Um, the first, um, and the first bullet and sub bullets are what we're going to talk about today, sort of NREL's initial efforts to evaluate DR aggregation nationwide and the lessons learned that utilities can offer um, for the, related to the pilots they've already completed. And then bullets two and three um, are, are where NREL is moving towards. Now that we understand a little bit more about the pilots, we want to get a sense of how you might actually scale these programs and then maximize value for the end, the end users, um, as well as the utility um, and other stakeholders. So all of the work from that first bullet um, is already publicly available in the, in the technical report um, shown here. Um, and as I said, the goal of this program or this report was to, to, to determine um, or describe all of the utility-led programs we could find across the country, um, and then some lessons learned from a couple of key case studies. Um, and so I'm going to provide um, some high-level analysis or discussion of what that report includes, um, and then we can go on to um, discuss or hear more from updates on the Austin Energy Program and SDE program. Um, so what do we do in this report? Um, we conducted 27 interviews with subject matter uh, experts from across the country, and the goal here was to identify any DR aggregation programs that we could find. Um, and then secondarily, we went back to these subject matter experts to build case studies around five programs that are listed here. So that includes Green Mountain Power in Vermont, Maui Electric Company um, in Hawaii, Pacific Gas and Electric um, SDE, as I mentioned, and finally SMUD. Um, and so those were the five that we identified um, for case studies. But as I mentioned, the, the goal of this report was to identify what is happening, um, not just in those five cases, but nationally. And so we identified 23 utility-led programs, um, all listed here. Um, and in particular, we demonstrate the types of technologies included. So most often, um, DR programs include PV and storage, um, and it's more and it's um, 
Uh, more recently, there's been an interest in incorporating EVs and other load control appliances um, into these programs. Um, I should say that this, um, this figure was developed or published in the report, and so Liberty Utilities has since um, gotten approval um, for its program. Um, and so that's something to know. Um, so this is the 23 utilities in terms of the um, technologies they include, and here's a map that describes it geographically. Um, along with the five utilities that we uh, did the case studies on. Um, you can see um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of geographic distribution of these DR aggregation programs, suggesting it's national in scope. Um, and we selected these five cases in particular um, because each one of them incorporated PV into the project, um, and they also had variation in program design um, in terms of the utility type, regulatory structure, um, the types of DERs included, and then finally the overall size. So SDE um, was the largest with significant, um, you know, hundreds of megawatts as opposed to um, the more pilot stage or what you might expect in a pilot of, you know, a few um, tens of homes as is the case in Vermont and SMUD. So let's think about um, what happened in those case studies. So it's important to note first that in all five of our case studies, the utility um, successfully demonstrated DER, ag DER aggregation provided the services it requested, whether it was load management or control, um, frequency response, voltage regulation, um, PV smoothing, and a variety of other use cases utilities were testing. Um, each one of these utilities was able to, um, or is in the process of demonstrating that DR aggregation can, in fact, work. However, as one would expect in any pilot program, um, each one of these utilities faced challenges um, in carrying out the program. Um, and those we categorized, there were five sort of key um, categories of challenges that transcended the cases, and they're listed there on the left. Um, not every utility faced the same challenges as you might expect, uh, but there are some key similarities. So for my purposes here, um, we'll highlight two of those. Um, the first being around DERMS development. So um, each utility um, in some form or fashion is developing a, a management system for these DERs or did so for the pilot that they were doing. Um, and they all face some issues with or some of them, excuse me, um, face some issues with incorporating or that potentially third party developed um, DERMs into their existing utility software programs, um, ensuring everything's compatible. Um, that was challenging in part because some of these pilots were new. Um, and so there were fewer third party providers of these software platforms. Um, but as DR aggregation programs um, mature, we're seeing more um, providers of these systems, um, which could make these challenges easier to address. Um, the other one I'm going to talk about on this slide is the communicating with DRs once the DRs are deployed and the DERMS is, is operational. And there can be some challenges there with first setting up communication between the different technologies and the DERMS, ensuring that when the DERMS sends out um, signals that the DERs are actually interpreting those signals correctly and responding appropriately. Um, and it can also be, even if that communication is cleared up, there can be challenges um, over time, particularly if the programs are, are based or the DERs are using Wi-Fi um, or there's um, differences in the types and how the communication is, is distributed between the, the DERMs, the aggregator, for example, and the individual DERs themselves. Um, and then there's a variety of other challenges listed here that other utilities might face, uh, but that leads us to some of the key lessons learned. And so, again, these are all in the report, uh, but here I've highlighted a couple um, that other utilities might find or might um, find value in. And the first is scaling these programs is likely going to require deploying a DERM. Um, it's somewhat easy to manually, you know, turn on or off DERs when you're talking about five or ten batteries, for example, as was the case in Vermont. But it'd be much more difficult to do that for, for hundreds and thousands of systems and doing it all um, quickly to provide the grid service when it's needed. Um, and so developing germs might be necessary. Uh, when developing these programs, utilities need to consider 
um, the customer value proposition. Um, in particular, net metering programs may not favor battery storage, um, and so that can influence how um, interested people will be in participating in these programs. Uh, again, utilities are going to face challenges deploying new technologies. Um, we found in a couple of the case studies it was problematic for siting storage. Um, Austin Energy and Kurt can probably provide a little bit more perspective on that. Um, but with any innovative new technology, um, siting and permitting that stuff with an AHJ can be um, difficult. And so utilities might want to be proactive thinking about um, how to get um, those new technologies online. Um, there'll be, as I mentioned, communication challenges between DERs and the utility. Um, that's going to be an ongoing challenge, especially as more um, appliances, for example, get smart and there's more distributed resources out there on the grid. And then finally, once all this technology is implemented, the types of technologies out there, how you operate those, for example, how you might use a battery, um, and the limits of the operation of those, and then finally, consumer behavior could all impact individual DER performance and how much value or load response, for example, you might get from a particular DER. Um, and those are just some of the lessons. I'm happy to talk through more of those during the Q&A, um, but at this point, I can pass it back off um, to you, Eric. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, I think we're, we're going to go over to Sergio now. And just as a reminder to everybody, uh, to please go ahead and type questions in as you think of them into the questions pane, and we'll be sure to save some time at the end for Q&A. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share an update on our preferred resources pilot. Um, so my name is Sergio Islas. Uh, I am with Southern California Edison. I am in our grid modernization and resiliency group and I am a senior advisor within uh, Edison. And so excited to share with you guys some of our learnings and provide you some considerations uh, to keep in mind, particularly as you're looking to integrate DRs as a grid solution, um, which is what our pilot is intending to do. Our pilot is a 10-year pilot, and so I'd like to give you a little bit of background before we jump into some of our, uh, where we are with the pilot today and some of our our key considerations for you to, to take with you. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background that will hopefully give you a better context of what we're working on. So SC's PRP pilot was launched back in 2013, as you see, you saw in the earlier, some of the earlier slides. Um, it's a self-initiated project. Uh, it's not under a regulatory proceeding or a mandate, but seeing the trend towards a greater use of DRs, SE was deeply interested and validating their performance to determine how much DRs can be counted on to serve load growth. And so that is ultimately the objective of the pilot, which is, uh, as stated here, is determine how much DRs can help serve load growth. Um, from a value proposition perspective, there are at least three key major areas that uh, the pilot helps provide value to our customers. The first one is it helps support reliability in our greater uh, Western LA Basin. Because we are primarily focused on deploying clean energy resources, it also supports our state's environmental goals. Um, and equally, because we're using a diverse mix of offerings, which includes solutions for customers to meet their energy needs, customers have a series of options that they can use to um, meet their needs and also support the objectives of the pilot. And so in the next slide, I'll provide you a bit more details about the location of the pilot and why we selected it. So the pilot is located or is being implemented in the southern portion of SE service territory. If you guys are familiar with Orange County, this is, um, this is uh, or what, I'm sorry, with SE's territory, this, this is the Orange County region in SE's territory. Um, and there are a few reasons why we, we picked this location. Um, one of the main reasons is this was an area that was the most, one of the areas most affected by the retirement of our nuclear generation station, Songs. And the impending retirement from one street cooling plants was creating a capacity deficiency. So in our area, we were experiencing or concerns, we had concerns about voltage uh, issues and also capacity deficiencies. 
And uh, studies performed by our CAISO, California Independent System Operator. This area was identified as an area that could be an effective area where to set resources that can help meet the overall um, capacity requirements in the region. It's also an area um, similar to other parts of our territory that's experiencing load growth. In this area, um, it's expected by the year 2022, we'll see a load growth of about 238 megawatts. And it's also representative of other areas in our territory. So if there's an area we wanna pick that has a lot of these uh, similar locations or, or similar characteristics, this, this, what, this is one of the reasons why it made it an ideal location. And lastly, as more DERs are deployed in the area, um, it will serve as a test bed to continue to give us opportunities to test other scenarios and the performance of DERs and help us inform what we need to do to help manage the grid under high DR uh, penetration. So in terms of the pilot, as I mentioned, we have a 238 megawatt load growth. So given this load growth in the region, the PRP gives us an opportunity to help us validate if DERs can manage this load growth to net zero. So effectively, and through this graph, what I'm showing you, is we're looking to keep the load growth by 2022 below that baseline you see represented by the red line. That pilot baseline is based on the recorded peak in 2013. As I mentioned, 2013 is the year that we launched the pilot. And so effectively what we're working on is keeping all of that yellow growth or that yellow section below that red line with a portfolio of DERs. So as Eric and Jeff mentioned, this is a, a significant undertaking. Um, a few pilots have taken this mass scale of an approach. Um, so let's focus now on how we are doing in relation to trying to meet this load growth in our for acquisition of DERs. So, um, just to give you a sense of where we are in our acquisition, we started off with acquiring and planning through our DSM programs a portfolio of 268 megawatts. And that 268 megawatts is based on the technology effectiveness factors. Essentially, it's a conservative effectiveness factors for the entire portfolio of about 11% to meet that 238 megawatts. And so what we want to do through this pilot is test whether or not that's, it's, that is accurate. The other challenge we've had though, however, is that DRs are not showing up as we had originally planned. And some of that has been driven because of regulatory delays in some of the contracting we've, we've done. Other reasons include uh, contracts being canceled or some of our own projects being downsized because of the shifting in needs in the area. And so of that 268 megawatts we had expected, um, 99 have already been canceled or downsized as for the reasons I just mentioned. However, what we've seen, if you notice here, is a larger uptake from our customer programs. And that was primarily done through targeted marketing and increased incentives. So what we expected from our programs originally um, has surpassed uh, a lot more than what we thought we were gonna get, which is making some of the difference. However, now we have about 91 megawatts now that um, are expected to come online through the year 2020. So given these two numbers, you do the quick math, you have about 190 megawatts expected by the year 2020, 2020, 2022. And so, um, we expect that customers will continue to adopt DRs themselves as well. And so some of those will be able to get integrated into the pilot. So now let me focus a bit on how the resources that we've deployed are performing. And so here is um, a representation of the portfolio of DERs and how they're performing over the summer of 2018. So, um, Specifically, what you see here is how DRs perform on August 7th. This is, represents our peak in the region um, in 2018. And so it's this, this here is focused predominantly not on the 99 megawatts deployed, 
but on the resource deployed as of August 9th, which is indicative of what was available for performing the measurement activities. And so this is about 87 megawatts that we have deployed as of August 9th, which is, again, a bit of a conservative um, um, performance that we see or a, a little bit of a difference from what we had expected to what we're seeing now. And this is probably roughly about 25% uh, less than what the 87 megawatts on the highest peak, which is on our ending 12. And so some of the things we um, have learned, um, and just to give you a little background, just take a quick step back, um, how we're actually doing the measurement activities for the DERs. So some of it includes uh, meter data, so particularly for the GG resource, the DGCHP, and energy storage, we have meter data where we can actually measure the performance. Some of it includes modeling, particularly for solar GG, but this is based on actual um, solar systems in the region that we've used to develop um, a model with high uh, consistency of what we actually see from actual production as well as EE, and then we're also using contract settlement data to determine the performance of demand response. So one of the key takeaways for me has been the effectiveness factors may need to be uh, adjusted down just because what, what we're seeing actually and what we actually plan to see. One of the biggest drivers has been energy efficiency. So for energy efficiency, we, we do a lot of ex ante uh, valuation in the industry. However, when you're trying to measure the impact of EE on the grid, this is not as apparent. And also you have the phenomena of customers um, sometimes using a lot more energy than they expected um, or we expected. Um, because now they have more energy, more efficient appliances or what have you. So that phenomena still is taken into account here. And what, what is counted for our performance is actually what are we actually seeing on the grid. So that number probably needs to get adjusted downward for us. Um, and then the other key piece for us, we don't have yet uh, an implemented advanced distribution management system or DERMS, but once we have that, it'll give us better monitoring uh, abilities so that we can uh, further validate the effectiveness of the portfolio as a whole. Um, the other key here is once a germ system is in place, we can have better capabilities to operate the DRs in concert and have the communication with customers' DRs and the in front of the meter resources. But you know, I think that there's still a bit early in terms of where the germ systems are being uh, developed and we're likely to see a more robust products in the future. So once we see that, um, we'll see more development on the SE side too. So now as you think about uh, incorporating DRs for your own uh, grids and <clears throat> look for other um, solutions that, that you may be interested. In. So here are some key takeaways and some future considerations for you guys to think about. One would be um, it's important to have a technical potential of what is a, a potential DR solution, but more importantly is to have a customer adoption potential, essentially a propensity model that allows you to see what is actually likely to be adopted from customers if that is uh, part of your solution. Uh, and to give you an example, part of our technical potentials included uh, just as an example, 160 megawatts of solar PV um, as a technical potential, and then about 81 megawatts of technical potential for demand response. And what we actually have seen is quite significantly less. And so that is, uh, I think, is important to take that into account. And also is important so that the right targeting um, is done and you're more effective at adopting or deploying DRs. The other key uh, takeaway in our acquisition of DRs has been uh, focusing on the attributes that are needed is a lot more effective than focusing on technology. 
So one of our initials, uh, one of our initial RFOs that we conducted was focused on distributed generation, solar PV. We went out for, uh, say, about 60 megawatts of DG, and we ended up procuring only about one or two megawatts. And so the second round of solicitations, um, we focus more on uh, the attributes we needed to manage this load growth. And out of that, it was a significant robust response where we ended up executing 125 megawatts of DERs out of that solicitation. So that's a significant difference in terms of how you think about uh, integrating DRs and, and what are the sources of the, where the DRs come from. Um, when you focus on the attributes instead of technologies, it, it'll increase the pool of resources available to you. And also significantly is the cost difference between uh, a utility scale or a resource that's focused on local needs versus system needs. And that's predominantly uh, because of economies of scale, right? So you have to set a lot more resources essentially to be able to get the same amount that you would get out of one, one potential solar, solar utility plan. Um, and then other considerations uh, for you to think about as well as we've learned through our pilot is that um, when you contract for DERs, it's important to be, incorporate some kind of flexibility into your contracts. Particularly as you see a shift in uh, load, uh, your peak may shift, um, our peak has shifted, um, uh, and so that is um, something that would be useful as well as if you think about the future technology enhancements you may have, perhaps you have a derm system that you might think about in the future, but you're not sure yet what are some of the provisions that some of the requirements for that, you might want to include something in there that allows you to have some flexibility, at least to come back to the table and talk to your counterparties and incorporate some of those changes that you may need. Um, and then lastly, for us, because our portfolio of DRs that we've acquired and planned for is a mix of competitive solicitation contracts as well as our programs. A better coordination between our customer programs and our contracts would result in less fatigue from customers and likely better adoption of DERs. And so that is another key lesson to think about as you put together a acquisition program, what are the different sources you're gonna use and how to coordinate those activities to maximize the adoption of DRs from customers. Um, and so that's, that's the information that I'm sharing with you guys today. Great, thank you very much, Sergio. That, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, we've got some questions coming in, uh, so keep, keep adding those questions and uh, we'll, we'll turn over to, uh, to Kurt now. Hello everyone, my name is Kurt Stogdell. I'm the manager for green building and sustainability for Austin Energy. Uh, my group also includes the Electric Vehicles and Emerging Technologies group, and that's where our DERMS initiative, Austin Shines, is housed. Um, this graphic illustrates the different components of the Austin Shines project. It's broken up into four major categories. We've got a utility scale deployment, where we have two different utility scale energy storage systems that are approximately one and a half megawatts and in the range of three megawatt hours. Um, one of those is co-located with a community solar farm that we have in our service area. And the other is located in a neighborhood that has a high penetration of distributed PV. We've got a commercial component of the project, which includes three commercial systems that are located on sites that also have uh, solar PV on site as well. We've got a residential component of it. We've got 24 houses that have solar with smart inverters, and then five of those houses have residential storage systems. They're using LG Chem ResU residential units. And then we've got a, a vehicle to grid component that we'll go into a little bit more uh, that's part of that project. And then we've got the DERMS part of it. That's the integration piece of it. So we've used uh, Doosan GridTech's DER optimizer platform or DERO 
and it takes weather forecasting, system availability from our SCADA system, and simulated ERCOT systems, and melds all that information together to optimize the uh, deployment of these different assets, looking at different use cases, uh, one being the utility use case, one being the use case for third-party aggregation, and the other being for customer end use as, as an individual customer and trying to look at how we blend all of those different use cases into best case scenarios for all the all the different players had a number of partners in this in this project uh would like to specifically call out obviously the uh, u.s department of energy uh and the texas commission for environmental quality who have been key partners in this as far as our timeline it's a three-year project we've got uh three phases uh, we've already gone through the contract and design phase and the deployment, deployment phase. We're midway through demonstration phase. We're starting to get some good data now. Um, and then there's some uh, information here about the, the level of funding. Uh, we've gotten about $5.3 million in external funding and have put in about $6 million of our own funding. As far as fielded assets for the, for the project, this is the community solar farm that I talked about. It's approximately 2.6 megawatts. If you look up in the left-hand side of the substation that's in the background, you can see one of our energy storage systems that's part of the project. Here's a close-up of that. It's an LG Chem Parker system. It's approximately 1.5 megawatts and 3 megawatt hours. To give you an idea of scale, that shipping container that houses the batteries is about 46 feet long. This is our other utility scale system. We looked at diversity of, of, of products and, and form factor as part of our project. Uh, this is a much more scalable uh, version. These are Unico's Y cubes. They're approximately 250 kW systems. Uh, there are seven of them here. They're approximately 1.5 megawatts and 2.5 and megawatts of, of uh, storage capacity with those. Uh, the trench in the all, all around the system is uh, to help accommodate uh, a future wall, which we're in the process of constructing now, uh, to fit with uh, neighborhood design guidelines and criteria. This is a rendering of what that project will ultimately look like. It's going to include educational signage and a viewing area, and it'll be one of the showcases for our Shines efforts and our, our DER messaging moving forward. This is one of our commercial installations. We went with STEM as a partner in this. Each one of these cubes, there's eight here, uh, house uh, approximately 18 kilowatt hours of lithium ion systems. Uh, since these systems don't have auxiliary cooling, we are uh, pretty much limited for now to putting them into mechanical rooms. Here's a graphic of what the systems look like with the panels removed, so you get an idea of what they look like. Again, very compact, very modular, kind of infinitely expandable, so you can really size them to what you need to need for the each application. Giving you an idea of the solar level of solar penetration that we have at the uh, Miller neighborhood, uh, here's a graphic illustration of, of the different rooftops that have solar. We've got approximately 246 rooftop installations on this feeder, uh, totally in about 1.1 megawatts of installed capacity of solar PV. We worked with the Pecan Street project on a V2 grid component of the system. It's one vehicle. Uh, it's a Nissan LEAF that we've converted with some auxiliary power control electronics. You can look in the background and see the big box in the background. That's what was required for us to be able to make this vehicle V2G compatible. Uh, so a lot of work has had to gone into that. It's definitely not ready for prime time as is, but uh, it's enabling us to, to do a proof of concept. As part of that, we've allowed about 30 miles of reserve range within the vehicle capacity to be able to allow it to still be used as a, as a, a transportation source. So we won't take it down below 30 miles of range during our normal dispatch cycles. That allows us to have about 10 kilowatts of capacity and 40 kilowatt hours of available uh, battery space to be able to use for dispatch. We have six different use cases that we're looking at for this project. Uh, if you look across the top, it speaks to the different energy storage systems that we've used 
to try and meet those different use cases. I think the key takeaway from this is that no one system can do it all. If you want to meet a wide variety of value streams, either from a customer perspective or a system stability perspective, you're going to need to have some diversity of resources so that you can meet a wide variety of needs. Um, we're learning a lot from these use cases, uh, so it's really been a key part of the project. This is an example of one of the commercial projects that we've got. This is their normal building load. This is an example of what happened when we dispatched energy storage to help reduce that peak. You can see with the orange graph there that it has impacted the, the, the peak demand for the buildings. These systems were deployed with the customer value proposition as the primary value stream. So anything that's made available to the utility is intended not to be at the customer's cost. Uh, after three months in our three systems that we deployed, we saw an average savings of about 6% on customer bills. Uh, all of that savings due to demand reduction for the, the various locations. Don't have good data yet on what the payback is. That'll come a little later on in the project. As far as lessons learned, uh, standards are, are a key part of our project. Uh, standards are evolving. They, they still have a ways to go to catch up. Uh, vendor knowledge of, of standards and their willingness and ability to, to meet those standards have been limiting uh, factors in that. We had to pick some new partners as a result of this that we, as, as we began to initiate the project. So it's, that's been a limiting factor. And I would say from a technology readiness perspective, if you're looking at it from a, a DER holistic integration perspective, that we don't really think the technology is quite there yet, although we think it'll be there pretty soon. Design is a critical aspect of, of DER deployment. There really needs to be significant study that goes into these systems before you deploy them, as opposed to just deploying them and figuring out what to do with them. Uh, we did distribution level studies on our systems. We didn't do market studies on our systems and have found that in ERCOT, systems over a megawatt can't be used for transmission cost of service reduction uh, because those, that energy gets net back out in settlement with ERCOT. So, Ironically, the biggest potential value we have for these systems is reducing our transmission costs of service. So if we were to do this over, we would reduce our systems to be under a megawatt in size each. Um, and also from a commercial perspective, uh, you need to consider not, not only the demand for the building itself, but any demand that you might have for additional requirements to meet utility needs as part of that uh, equation. Siting was a big part of the lessons learned. We worked up front with fire and codes because there wasn't, uh, there weren't fire codes set up for energy storage. Um, as a result of that, we, we, we've been able to avoid some of the conflicts we would have potentially had, I think, in getting these, these worked through. Uh, we had some commercial siting challenges uh, due to code and technology readiness, since we didn't have auxiliary cooling in our systems, we could only go in air conditioned spaces. So we were limited in sites to going into mechanical rooms that had air conditioning and had uh, enough su fire suppression on site to be able to accommodate them. So we were, had to reduce our, our pool of potential sites from 12 potential sites to three that were ultimately suitable for for siting and, and uh, deployment. On the residential side of things, space on, on the sides of houses gets to be an issue as you site a circuit box, a meter can, a solar inverter, and a battery energy storage system. Uh, the other option would have been to go into the garage for code reasons within Austin. It would have required us to put in bollards to protect them from from potential vehicle collisions. So we opted out of that strategy and went with the with the side of the house for the location there. Uh, communications is a critical issue. Uh, we looked at both AMI and cellular. They both have pluses and minuses. Uh, cellular costs proved to be prohibitive for us for direct utility control of smart inverters for, for solar. So for that 
reason we looked only at uh, uh, <clears throat> automated control there um, on the on the V2G side of things, we had great response from our system when it was charging and available. But if the system was in idle, it wouldn't have been available for grid support. So for now, V2G for us would be limited to scheduled future activity. So we'd have to have some advance notice before we'd be able to deploy them. And then on the value side of things, um, again, we talked about transmission value being highest. Um, talked about the commercial values and variables there. And I think that if we want these resources to be available sooner rather than later, if we can value stack and bring in more than one value stream for these, these items, it makes them uh, economically viable a lot sooner. As far as key takeaways, we learned a tremendous amount from working with these systems ourselves. I think, uh, just trying to learn from others won't get you all the way there. Uh, they're very complex in nature. Each of them is a system of systems. Uh, we're gonna look at the reliability value as we get further on. We think that as penetration of these uh, resources becomes more uh, prominent, that the value will, will uh, rise correspondingly. And then we're really looking at this as critical to our planning moving forward. The simulations are really providing a lot of of in-depth perspective for us from what if scenarios and is really helping us prepare for the future. So that's what I've got. Great, thanks Kurt. Yeah, th thanks to all three of you for, for those great presentations. Um, so we've got some questions in, I'll start working my way through them and uh, uh, folks on the line, feel free please to, to add additional questions to the queue as we go here. Um, there's a sort of initial definitional question that came up during Jeff's presentation that maybe we could just start with that uh, for foundation and then get into a few specific questions for Sergio and Kurt. Um, Jeff, one of the participants was asking if you could distinguish between uh, DERMs and versus what we mean by VPP and sort of how, how the different pieces of this fit together. Yeah, no, good call. Um, so a virtual power plant, I mean, is is similar to the definition of DR aggregation program. Um, we use the two terms synonymously just to suggest that, um, and there could be a lot of configurations of it, but the impetus here is where a utility designs a program where they can control the operation of DERs um, on the grid. And those DERs can then provide similar services to what you might expect from a large centralized power producer. Um, and so that kind of corresponds to the definition of a virtual power plant. Um, DR aggregation is the same. Um, when you think about DERMs, that's a piece of a program. So you need a, a DER management system or software platform um, if you want to do, likely you'll need one, if you want to do a large scale program where you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of DERs operating on your system within the program itself. So you would use a DERM to control the DERs or call on the DERs to provide grid services um, to the utility and then the utility can compensate those, those um, end use customers for the services they provide. So that's how I would describe it. A DERM is a part of a component of a VPP program or DER aggregation program. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, all right, so for um, Sergio and Kurt, uh, there's a, a couple of different questions about um, how you think about the value proposition, um, both for, for your utilities and for uh, customers that you've been working with, um, particularly the economic value proposition. So maybe we'll, we'll start with uh, Sergio and SE. Um, it'd be great if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you think about the economic value to SCE um, of going down uh, pathways such as the PRP versus other kind of more bulk level procurement options. Um, or in other words, you know, if you're investing in this, uh, uh, in uh, programs like PRP being a, a tool that's available to you, how would you think about where you use that versus where you use others, um, particularly in the kind of economic value terms? Yeah, so for purposes of the pilot, um, the pilot was focused on validating the performance of DRs. And 
part of the economics consideration for us in as we were doing our acquisition of DRs is looking at what are some of the tools we have for us. So customer programs is something that's already customer funded. And so we can just leverage that and target the marketing in the PRP region. The broader acquisition we've done through solicitations goes through a least cost, best fit approach, where we look to um, acquire or procure the resources at the, on the least cost basis. It's, it's, it's a, a little more complex. I'm not doing it justice in terms of looking at what is the overall value um, of what we're getting um, for a resource. But as I guess as you consider um, an alternative to perhaps a distribution upgrade or a traditional power plan, um, you could you, obviously the economies of scale are going to drive some of the um, acquisition of DRs higher than you would ex than you would spend otherwise. However, there's that's just one component as you consider DRs for particularly in California. That's that's one thing to think about, but there are other there are other value propositions that are not just economic um, focus, and so that's that's part of what goes into the consideration as you look at different DR solutions here um, within the state of California. We have a bit more work going on uh, with a little more refined guidelines as we look to DRs for distribution deferral. So there's an entire proceeding associated with that, which is looking at the cost effectiveness of DRs. Um, it's similar to the other procurement we, we do, where we look at the, the various value streams, and that could be financial, quantitative, and qualitative as well. And so that's part of what goes into the calculation as we look at the cost of a traditional system upgrade versus a DR portfolio. I don't know if, I hope, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, 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 that's great, thank you. Um, and uh, for, for Kurt and Austin, um, how, how do you think about that question of assessing economic value and when you might turn to this in the future versus other other options? Um, and there's sure. a, there's a so, follow-on question that relates to that. Sorry, I'll, do, I'll add a follow-on question about how that might be different amongst the different uh, kind of customer segments you talked about. You talked about some commercial relationships, and if you could, if you could add that, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, so Austin Energy is vertically integrated, but we, you know, in, in order to, to maintain that, that status, we think that we'll probably have to, or we'll certainly have to provide avenues to the marketplace for third-party aggregators and our customers as these uh, resources become more prevalent. Um, in order to do that, we've got to provide mechanisms for them to be able to realize value. Um, we worked up a, a methodology called a system LCUE or a system, you know, system levelized cost of energy, looking at the feeder level uh, value of inputs and outputs of these resources as a barometer for whether or not it makes sense to do it economically. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it you know, basically we weigh the potential costs of these and the, the overall values and make a determination as to what do we, what we can do. But, we, you know, we, we've got to allow for a, a, a platform of platforms, if you will, that allow different scales of resources to interact at the distribution level to be able to accommodate this. So that's, from a planning perspective, what we've been looking at. And then also, uh, as Sergio talked about, we've got to look at the non-wires alternative side of things from a distribution planning perspective and, and how we accommodate that going forward as well. Great. And uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, I think you sort of covered uh, you, how your relationships are set up with uh, commercial customers, but there's a sort of follow-up question on how, on how that's set up and you, and you think about pursuing relationships like that. Sure. Um, Right now, since it was a grant, uh, we installed the systems at no cost. Um, I, you know, I think what we would like to do is look at it either, you know, it, it's, you have two choices. You either allow somebody else to come in and, and provide those services or do those services, or you look to do them yourselves. I think if we're able to size them appropriately such that we can share value for the system, we can then provide incentives for our customers to participate with us. 
And that's either through direct incentives and direct payments or utility, possibly utility ownership of, of customer sided assets, or you develop a rate which allows your customers to participate in a way that's meaningful to them as well. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I've, I've got a follow-up for Sergio. Um, uh, sort of two two parts. One is um, if you could talk more about the DR makeup in the in that second RFP, and uh, related to that, uh, the comment you made about technology effectiveness factors and and how you might adjust them going forward. So the makeup for the second solicitation. Um, I would say that the bids we received was a mix of resources, both in front of the meter, behind the meter, um, and it includes uh, demand response, energy storage, solar PV pair systems, solar and energy storage pair systems, as well as uh, energy efficiency. Um, however, what ultimately was selected was a portfolio of demand response, um, and this is demand response for the most part, I want to say that, um, if I recall correctly, it, it included um, all behind the meter energy storage that would that would help effectuate demand response. And then the, um, there was also a significant amount of energy storage in front of the meter and some hybrid systems, some of the pair systems, energy storage. Um, and, and solar that was targeting commercial industrial customers. So there was a second question. Um, can you repeat that question? The second question, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, second question was about uh, technology effectiveness oh, factors. Yeah, the, the technology. So, so as we think about a meeting a solution, um, you, you obvious, you wanna have a margin because you're gonna have some level of terminations or cancellations in, in your procurement portfolio. So that's, uh, that's sort of a given, I think. That's uh, sort of an industry standard. You, you want some kind of margin to hedge against a fallout of contracts or DRs. So how that might impact us going forward is to say, if, if particularly we need, let's just suppose we need 10 megawatts for a particular distribution deferral project, um, or effectively, we need 10 megawatts actually on the grid. We need to see that, and that's what we need as a solution. So when we do our acquisition, that may adjust um, how much we actually go after. Um, but I think we need a lot, a, a bit more validation in uh, the performance of DRs. As more uh, DRs come on in this PRP region, we'll be able to do some, some more of that and help inform that. Um, I think a DERMS can go a long way too, as I mentioned, to help you do better uh, determination of how DR is performing because you obviously need to have access to the data to be able to then determine their performance. Great, thanks. Um, and unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time here and there's, there's a lot of great questions remaining. Um, we have the list of questions and for the some of the more specific ones we haven't been able to get to, we can try to uh, get in touch with you. Um, to, to see if we can get you some additional answers to those questions. Um, one last quick question for Kurt that relates to the, the um, I'm sorry, this one's for Sergio also, I, I believe. There's a, there's a question about the transmission benefits and what that means for system sizing. Uh, yeah, that's for Kurt. Um, and and uh, it's one of the lessons learned that you, that you mentioned, I believe, Kurt. Uh, sure. Uh, we sized our systems really looking at uh, distribution system needs and uh, conditions. We didn't take into consideration the fact that any asset over a megawatt uh, as, as, a, you know, as an individual metered asset couldn't be contributed to our transmission cost of service reduction. So they, weren't, they aren't eligible to reduce our 4CP costs or our transmission costs. So if we were to do it over again, we might have to look at the idea of having, you know, if we had a system that was, you know, three megawatt hours and, you know, or, or, or you know, say, you know, two and a half megawatts, maybe we have four systems that were under a megawatt, all with individual meters to be able to provide that value if that was the highest and best value for them. 
Great, thank you. Um, so, unfortunately, we have we have more questions, but uh, we're, we're at time, so we'll, we'll close it there. I want I want to thank Jeff, uh, Kurt, and Sergio very much for joining us. Uh, that, that was a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Uh, and for all the attendees, we'll be posting a recording of this uh, webinar to the DGIC website, um, and it might be worth checking out for for other resources that that might be of interest. Uh, so, thank you all very much for joining us, um, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.